Good afternoon, everybody. Scott Stevens here with another perspective. And this day, this uh, crazy day in the midst of all the chaos that's going on in the world, uh, we need to talk about currencies again. We've uh, talked about uh, some of the past days. Let me look at them. We have hit. Uh, we have hit accountability. We've hit revolution. We've looked at black swans. And it's kind of obvious that we're dealing with a few of those or even a flock of those little guys, even as we speak. Um, we have uh, looked at uh, currencies. We did that back on July 13th, uh, central banking on July 20th, um, the fourth turning. We did that on Monday. And now we've got to look at the petrodollar. What is the petrodollar? If you've come across that term at some point in the past, then you probably have familiarized yourself with it just a little bit. But it is kind of a, it's a big deal because when the United States essentially went bankrupt in 1933 and collected everyone's gold, revalued gold from 20, just a little under $21 to $35, they said, okay, now we can print or now bring all of the dollars that the Federal Reserve at that point in time had printed, bring them into some kind of backing. And that was important for that to happen. And the other thing was that uh, in 1971, Nixon uh, reduced or clawed back what was called the convertibility or the ability for the government to then pay out people who held debts against the United States government uh, $35 on each, on each dollar, excuse me, for $35, they could get an ounce of gold for the debts of the United States that they held. So when you have trade imbalances, your backing of reserve currency or backed currency can be depleted rather quickly. And in 1971, we were fighting a war. We had begun the great social experiment. We had begun uh, the great, I guess it was the great society is what it was called at that point in time, where welfare really began to take off. And honestly, we just simply couldn't afford that with uh, all that was happening at that point in time. So uh, what we ended up doing was adding, adding on another uh, another backing. We had to come off of gold in 1971 and we needed to revert to a system. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head on over here. We're going to add this. Uh, we're going to just go to screen two and share. And so what we did was uh, we went to oil and that, term, that way the term petrodollar was then born. So the question we asked today is does the petrodollar actually have a future? There are many countries that would like to say, no, it doesn't. We want to take the ability of the United States and the U.S. Treasury in particular, we want to take away from them the ability to sanction. We've got numerous entities under sanction right now, whether they're Chinese, Iranian, uh, whether they're Russian, and uh, other, other bad guys as dictated by literally nothing more than the politics of the time. These entities, in one way or another, have gotten in the way of the banking cartel, the banking cartel wishing to keep their, um, their influence uh, alive. All right, so let's uh, just kind of roll on through this, baby. So we have to understand the U.S. dollar, Saudi Arabia, and oil. Those three inexorably wound together. And it's, it, it's crazy how deep this actually goes. Instead of being backed by something as simple as a metal, we now have three entities that are, are bound together. All right, uh, and this is kind of a, a sad, crazy, unfortunate statement, but this, this actually happened back in 1993. What, King, what Saudi King said, truly America is my favorite slave. I summon my blue-eyed slaves anytime it pleases me. I command the Americans to send me their bravest soldiers to die for me. Anytime I clap my hands, a stupid genie called the American ambassador appears to do my bidding. When the Americans die in service, their bodies are frozen in metal boxes by the U.S. Embassy and American airplanes carry them away as if they never existed. Truly, America is my favorite slave. And there's the attribution. So what value are we getting out of this deal where we have given so much power to Saudi Arabia? Yes, we get oil. We get oil. And they get our dollars. Now, oil is ultimately a tax on the entire world's economy, a tax on energy, on that, and a tax on the ability to get work done. When you go to work, you use oil, you use gasoline, and then that money either goes to, well, goes to the producer straight up, 
And in the 1970s, Saudi Arabia had massive, massive fuel oil reserves, and it was very easy to produce that oil at an exceedingly low cost in the single dollars per barrel. And it has gotten more and more difficult as they're reaching not the end of their reserves, but let's just say it's getting more difficult to get the cheap stuff out. And at the same time, technologies have changed whereby we can use a little more complex methods to then extract oil out of America, out of Britain, out of other parts uh, where fracking has happened. Um, the environmental cost of that is not included, and there's very little money reserved for environmental remediation. And I'm certainly of the opinion that that day has got to happen. All right, so back to the petrodollar. It, the petrodollar is any U.S. dollar paid to oil exporting countries in exchange for oil. The dollar is the preeminent global currency. As a result, most international transactions, including oil, are priced in dollars. Oil exporting nations receive dollars for their exports, but not in their own currency. In addition, most oil exporting nations own their oil industries. That's not the case in the United States, where we've privatized that, where it is Exxon, Texaco, Mobil, Union 76, I don't know if they're around anymore, but we've marathon. Uh, we've got privateers that have come in and did the wildcatting, and it has been that way since Rockefeller and Standard Oil back in the late 1800s, and that monopoly had to be busted up. And even though in the last 40 years we have seen a re-coagulation, if you will, of those oil conglomerates back into behemoths once again, and it's always in the, under the guise of reducing costs, whether that was a legitimate reason or not. That's certainly a byproduct because, you know, why pay 40,000 people to do the work when you can bring them all under the same umbrella? And the, then you've got a, an employee pool of, say, 32,000. So you've saved that jobs, the, the jobs, or you've cut the jobs of the 8,000 people. And more often than not, they end up to be middle and upper management positions. So they're higher. You know, they're higher paying jobs. In addition, uh, and that's kind of really the crux of this whole thing, although it is a bit of a side project that uh, most of these oil exporting nations own their own industries, whereas it has been privatized. And that was the big push through the 80s was the privatization. You look at uh, Norway, where their whole sovereign wealth fund is the people's money, and that was earned by petroleum. As a result, most of these oil exporting nations also then peg their currencies to the dollar. It's allergy season for me, guys. That way, if the dollar value falls, then so does the price of their domestic goods and services. And that helps those countries avoid wide swings in inflation. So this all goes back to the history of the gold standard. And just after World War II, in fact, before World War II ended, Bretton Woods back in 44, the United States held most of the world's supply of gold. It did so under, in a way, coercion. As World War II began and began to get aggressive, there were nations that wanted their supply of gold safeguarded. And the shores of America were far enough away from the conflict in Europe and Asia that those nations' gold was ferreted away, was shipped away off to the states for safety. And there are many of those nations which have yet to receive their gold back, even after seven plus decades. So it was a theft of sorts. So it agreed to redeem any U.S. dollar for its value in gold if these other countries pegged their currencies to the dollar. Other countries signed on to this deal in the 1944 Bretton Woods Conference and established the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency. And in a way, it made sense because after the war, you know, the previous empires, the previous big guys had then been you know, beaten down. The coming collapse of the petrodollar. So the U.S. uses this power of the petrodollar to enforce its foreign policy, but many countries just don't fight back. They're afraid of what it would mean uh, to the collapse of the system that we're using presently. For example, the United States sanctioned Iran for refusing to halt its development of potential nuclear weapons. Similarly, it hit Russia with trade embargoes for inviting, invading Crimea and creating a crisis in Ukraine. Ooh, that's a whole other story that has another side to it. China called for a replacement of the U.S. dollar as a global currency, and ironically, it is also one of the largest foreign holders of the dollar simply because of the volume of trade 
that has gone on between the United States and China over the last 30 years. It makes sense that when Americans buy things from Chinese manufacturing, that they get paid in the U.S. dollar, since it is the reserve currency, the, the vehicle by which these international settlements are trade, traded. And if gold set the, the, excuse me, if oil set the standard for that means of exchange, that means that the pipelines and the, and the, the exchange rates, all of that is then pre-made because of the exchange of oil. And then other uh, mercantilism just kind of fell in line in the wake of that. So nations, the, uh, the issue with this then is even as we try to get off of oil because of global warming or climate change, whether you believe in that or not, that progress is underway as we begin to wean ourselves off of oil. And even in the wake of, uh, of COVID now, there is far, far less oil being used because of that. So there's never been a free market for crude oil. The world's oil is controlled simply by a monopoly as it was a hundred years ago. That monopoly appears to have been broken up, but if you could put people on the boards and, and run as presidents, even if you have to keep different uh, sets of books, different regions and bidding for, for oil leases and so forth, there's still only so many people that can afford to get into that kind of business, just like car manufacturing or, or air travel. It takes a certain size of a checkbook to begin that kind of a project. And then if you're going to come into the big boys game, you've got to survive. And the little guys, the little upshoots, unless you're in a niche project, a niche thing that is, is, is kind of at hand and you're developing your own market, that is allowed to happen. And then you're not impinged on too greatly. But then the, if you're seen to be growing, the monopoly steps forth and said, all right, we're just going to buy you out. And especially if you've gone public, then that allows that to happen. So now we kind of begin to get into a different aspect of this, or paper money versus real money, real gold. Hey, Vicky, good to see you in there. Um, where, we, uh, where, we, where we've gone through, uh, where we're actually using space, gold and silver, for the currency, and then the paper money was backed by old, and now we're uh, working at versus, versus real gold. So in the beginning, dollars were backed by this, and now they're simply backed by the might of the military, the ability of that monopoly, of that cartel, to exert its will, its wishes, its agenda upon the various players that we've got across the, goal, uh, across the globe. All right, Alan Greenspan, uh, love him or leave him, you know, he was, he was a character in Federal Reserve Chairman from 1987, uh, uh, yeah, on, on through a bit. He basically said, I'm sad that it's politically inconvenient to acknowledge what everyone knows, that Iraq war was largely about oil that they had to do something to bring that great national reserve into the cartel. The cartel needed to go and exploit that because otherwise the wealth that was underneath that nation, and that is just the first of a list, would have stayed with the people, stayed with the local infrastructure projects, stayed with the local education, stayed with the people's money. You know, And that is typically how it has been, is that a nation's wealth it belongs to the citizens and hasn't been privatized. And that seems to be one of the obstacles that we've really kind of run up against is, uh, is privatization. Just a quick little excerpt as, uh, as the Iraqi budget in 2017, federal dollars allocations. And it's interesting that they had uh, almost $68 billion worth of revenue. The government ran on, on just $10 billion more. So nearly the bulk of the entire government's operations were funded alone by those nation's reserves. Now, had that money gone to a company first, and then the company earned the profits, earned the gross proceeds from that, and then sold it back to the people, then the government has to tax the people to fund itself. But if the government can use those national reserves to then fund its operations, the people are not taxed in a way that we begin or that we do see in the Western world where privatization has been the man, uh, has been the motto, the banner that has been carried for uh, since, well, a long, long time now, but certainly since the 80s uh, during the Reagan administration when that really we nationalized water, we nationalized all those resources that typically belong to the people. So what this means is this net deficit, actually we're down here at about 100, 100 billion, uh, is, is 21 billion dollar deficit. And this is actually in dinar. What that means is that the government has to borrow money. 
And what do you do when you have to borrow money? You've got to pay it back. And if you have to pay it back, then ultimately it has to be paid back with interest. And that's where the banking cartel comes on in. Petrodollar, Saudi Arabia, and the greater part of Israel. Once you begin to look at Saudi Arabia and Israel as potentially being partners in crime, partners in operations, partners, then the Middle East begins to make a lot more sense, even with what is happening today. And it's interesting because these two are actually allies and they share a bloodline that goes way, way back. And it's not an allegiance that typically is acknowledged in, uh, in, in the greater world. And if you want to go down a rabbit hole, look at 9-11 and the, and the allegiance that happened between Israel and Saudi Arabia because they had an agenda. And then they needed the blue-eyed army, so said the Saudi king, to come and do their bidding. So dollars at the top, military in between, the oil, and then the soldiers overseas. So what do these three men have in common? Ultimately, they refused to accept American dollars for oil. They wanted something of value something that was worth what they were exporting out of their national treasure, something they had that had to be sent on out. Hillary emails revealed that NATO killed Gaddafi to stop Libyan creation of gold-backed currency for attempting to compete with the Western central banking system. And Gaddafi was snubbed out by NATO. This was nine years ago, back in 2011. And with his nation's natural wealth, he had collected gold. And the whole idea was to create this pan-African, especially at least in North Africa, banking system, independent of the Western banking system and independent of Europe. They had the resources to do it. Africa is by far and away wealthy enough to sustain itself and its needs into the decades in the future. But with imperialism in full bore, you know, taking and taking and taking, and then as they, you know, kind of put in their own leaders in these, these African countries, then those leaders are rewarded and showered with untold riches that end up offshore in the British banking system. So Libya moved away from U.S. dollars in 2009. He passed away two years later. Iraq moved away from the U.S. dollar in 2000. He died three years later. Syria moved away from the U.S. dollar in 2006, and they're still working on this character. They're still working on this, and we still have soldiers over there that have, well, let's just say they're running sentry missions, you know, and protecting oil wells, Syrian sovereign territory. We've got the American flag planted around because we want the revenue from that for whatever reason. It doesn't end up in the U.S. Treasury. It goes somewhere, and that's something that needs to be, you know, talked about. Not what the man has done to his citizens, but what we have, laws we have breaking by being over there and creating this turmoil, this hornet's nest, as, uh, as, as the Israeli Mossad called it. And then the Iran moved away from the U.S. dollar in 2008, and they are presently under sanction. So, enter some of the other big guys. Uh, the oil price war that's happened recently will expedite the end of the petrodollar and the rise of a Chinese-Russian currency, so says Russian TRT's Max Kaiser. And in the article, it goes on to say the U.S. shale market is to bear the brunt of the raging oil price war that has been set, has sent the Dow Jones and crude prices down, and Saudi Arabia will honestly fare no better. Meanwhile, Russia has got the best hand of the game, Max Kaiser believes. There's several causes for the slump in the oil prices, and the dispute between Mos Moscow and Riyadh led OPEC, and the coronavirus outbreak is not the exhaustive list. We're witnessing part two of the 2008 crisis with the credit bubble blowing up once again, something that was only just waiting to happen. So whatever the reason behind the oil market meltdown, Russia is in a better position to handle it as opposed to the U.S. shale oil, which we know the extraction costs uh, of, of American shale, minimum, minimum, $30, $35, more likely averaged out in the higher 40s before it becomes a break-even proposition. And I know the administration presently has kind of touted touted America's energy independence, but that can only happen at higher energy prices and ultimately at a much higher environmental cost. And that cost, as I said earlier, is not included. I, I believe that we really should have a wellhead tax and that, that tax then goes into reserve funds. So when these companies ultimately bend the knee to these foreign oil producers simply at a price point alone, that we come in and clean up the mess that this race for fracking has created. 
So the U.S., on the contrary, is in a really bad position, quote unquote, in this high stakes game with American shale stocks already taking a hit. And Kaiser predicting that this will be a complete evisceration of the American shale industry. It's going to need a massive bailout and massive money printing. And that is already underway. And that was one of the graphics I did not get into this is watching the, the well count of American producers is already down by half. And this was the last time I looked, which was probably the top of the month, the first of July. And then it's probably only dropping, even as we've seen a little bit of recovery, that is until the economy recovers and people choose to take the risk, go to work, go on a vacation, spend money on things which require energy, that this industry is going to stay in the doldrums. The other thing that's catch, catching up to it is, is renewable energies and the push by Tesla, which is, believe it or not, 240 somewhat billion dollar market capitalized uh, country or company. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So where we are as COVID continues to work across this landscape is that uh, we're having to, well, we can't raise taxes. Raising taxes just isn't possible and making meaningful spending cuts. We can't because we're literally the regular budget would be about $4 trillion. We'll probably end up with a budget this year, probably closer to eight to 10 trillion when all is said and done. And if tax receipts are closer to two trillion, that means that we've probably printed upwards of six trillion dollars. Literally printed. They're not backed by anything, and even oil would have to go up in value to allow for that uh, that that to continue. So ultimately, what we're left with is the final option of just printing money. Printing money requires no immediate sacrifice and certainly no spending cuts. It's a perfect solution for a growing country that wants to avoid making sacrifices. However, printing more money than needed can lead to inflation. Therefore, a country can somehow generate a global demand for its currency. And then at that point, as the permission to the permission slip to print more money. And this is where we've been for 40 years. This is where we've been since since Nixon yanked us off the gold, the gold dollar. And this and this thing. So what where we are is looking for a solution. There has to be a different kind of solution. And it was the Russians, the Russian flag in the background, and then a little bit of Bitcoin, Bitcoin not being the proposed uh, recipient of this, but probably an individual or an entirely new cryptocurrency, but Russia proposing a new oil-based cryptocurrency to replace better dollars. And this isn't brand new news. This happened in the first half of 19 last year. So the past week has not been really rich developments in the crypto market. Some news from Russia, however, they are calling attention in the, that is calling attention to the community. The lower house of the Russian Federal Assembly, the Duma, is scheduled to carefully review and approve a new cryptocurrency regulation next month. What was even more interesting is the energy ex-minister had reportedly suggested the development of the introduction of an oil-backed cryptocurrency. Furthermore, the Energy Corporation, which he is presently managing, is in the final stage of the oil-backed cryptocurrency project's roadmap. Recently interviewed, he pointed out several positive things that the adoption of a crypto settlement system would bring. First of all, it would end, it would result in the avoidance of costs related to the use of currencies, the cross-border payments, where the bank always takes that percentage regardless of which direction the currency is moving. They take their slice. Secondly, the exchange rate fluctuations associated with fiat money would no longer be an issue that adds up that adds up in the oil trade and related risks. Last but not least, the new settlement system would potentially result in a decrease of trade restrictions and commissions. The middle one. And the trade restrictions will probably be the, the, the straw that breaks the camel back. As these nations that have been sanctioned, these individuals, these corporations, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline from Russia back into Germany, just to keep the economy going and the people warm, we've had the gall to, to sanction that project because we want the American frackers to then load up our energy, which used to be illegal to export up until just a few years ago, off to uh, off to Europe. So, yeah, yeah, there's there's reason to leave the dollar. These these nations, these companies, I, I, in, a, in a way, I'm surprised it hasn't just happened yet. But anyway. The blockchain would have the capability of checking and verifying every single oil barrel in the whole chain, and this would absolutely be free of charge. It's just a function of blockchain. What's even more intriguing is that the new system would potentially be used not only for crude oil and gas trade, but for any other exchangeable resource, and that would add value, great value to, to these blockchains. 
and we're back to uh, Clint. So, you know, when we when we send off the military and we we topple these these leadership positions to bring about a change, uh, we we end up literally taking their their booty. We we grabbed and this isn't Libya's, this is actually Iraqi oil. But Hillary Clinton's emails recently revealed that intelligence sources explained to her the quality of gold and silver in Qaddafi's Libya was worth more than seven billion dollars. Now those were at 2011 prices, which are similar to where we are today, and was intended to be used to establish a pan-African currency based on the Libyan gold dinar. Do you not think these other nations would have just rushed into that? That would have been huge, a huge opportunity and a huge blow to the Western banking world. This plan was designed to provide the, uh, the Francophone African countries with an alternative to the French franc. And this was one of the reasons that the French president uh, supported the NATO invasion back in Libya again back in 11. So literally without the tyranny of the Rothschild control over the issuance of money, we could all live as wealthy people. We wouldn't have so much money just slowly trickling up, trickling up to these power brokers, to the bankers, to those that control, because then the resources of these nations would ultimately be left to the people. And that, for me, would absolutely be the gift. So w here we are. We kind of sit with, um, with gold in one hand, the money of kings, silver, the money for the people as the common means of exchange. If you need to go to the grocery store, it would be silver coins, some kind of some kind of exchange thing. Or what's coming about and rapidly being adopted are cryptocurrencies. And that seems to be the future. We have a few options. You know, if, if it's something you wanted to take action upon, then you've got to literally take some action. You've got to find a way to get your fiat money out of your bank account and then over to and into some kind of other currency. Ethereum is, is one that I discovered in 2016 and has been very good to me. Steemit, that's their symbol. Um, let's, let's go back one. Steemit, uh, which is kind of a, a, a Facebook-like thing that isn't necessarily, uh, it, it's just a non-censored platform for open discussion. Cryptocurrencies were kind of the big thing, but it has certainly grown from that. And then, of course, the granddaddy of all, Bitcoin, which my impression, my sense is that when we do go, go through this crisis and, and a reevaluation of the value of currencies, that the Federal Reserve or whatever structure is in place at that, at that particular point in time is going to have to reback our currencies, are our, our, all of those dollars, those trillions of dollars that are floating out there, which means gold would end up being maybe $50,000 an ounce, $80,000 an ounce, depends on how much debt that they want to back with it. And if they don't add cryptocurrencies to the mix as well, I would think that that, that move would ultimately be somewhat short-sighted. And then that would push Bitcoin from where it is today in the $11,000 range. Just uh, last week, it was in the $9,000 range. So it's moved up rather smartly as we're realizing that nobody's government, nobody's government is going to, are going to be able to get themselves out of this economic situation without having to uh, impact uh, the, the number, the quantity of currency that's in place. So we've got a couple of options. And uh, Coinbase is certainly one of them. And it was the one that I used first of all. That was my thing. I, mean, I keep a little over there, not much. I keep most of, of what I own in a wallet that is offline. It's kind of nice and quiet. And then what you can do is then jump into other currencies, Ripple, Stellar Lumens, Litecoin, Bitcoin, Chainlink, Onyx. There, there's other options. And then once you buy Bitcoin, you go through, you connect your bank accounts, you, you sign in. Just, just like you would to say Wells Fargo or, or Bank of America or Chase or PenFed or, or something like that. And then they connect to your checking account and you're capable of buying Bitcoin on the spot or any of these other currencies. I tend to buy the other ones because if they go up, they're going up in addition to Bitcoin going, Bitcoin going up. So your gains can be appreciable. And there are other currencies like Bitrix, which deal with a whole slew of other cryptocurrencies, all which have their own purpose, their own use case, their own markets, their own quantities, their own algorithms, their own reasons for existing. So this is a whole field of, of, of finance that just simply didn't exist 10 years ago. 
and that coin market cap is kind of an interesting place. It's actually a really good place to go in and begin to research some of these other currencies, their functions, functionality, where you could buy them, price histories, and so forth and so on. And this is ultimately where money is going. I firmly believe that it will be taken out of the hands of the powers that be in probably the not too distant future, not because they're willing to let it go, but because they have to let it go. And that's the thing about the banking system is that they're going to have to let go of the way it's been. The market forces will simply demand that they either revalue gold and silver to the debt that they've already created or it will break. And when that happens, the value of what breaks, which would be the dollar, goes very, very quickly to near zero. And we've seen numerous economies where this has happened recently. Venezuela is one of them. Zimbabwe is another one. Germany, it happened after World War I when uh, the, the Allies demanded reparations. And, you know, you've you got to pay so many billion Deutschmark. Well, they said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll pay you back in Deutschmark. Or in hard, real asset, which then takes value outside of the economy and away from the people. And so the, the, the Weimar, that German dollar, ended up uh, needing 10 million of them to buy a loaf of bread. Here, here's your, here's your billion back, but it's worth about five bucks. Even the U.S. penny in 1913, in today's money, was worth about $1.15. You can imagine going to the store, three cents buys your loaf of bread. If it were still backed by gold, three cents would buy you a loaf of bread. That could still happen if we had money that was backed by something substantial rather than just the promises, the hope that one day the United States will eventually be able to pay its debts. And as we know, we're, we're, we're 25 or will be before the end of this year, some $25 trillion in debt, and there just is no way. There's no way. Default of some way or another is an eventuality. And for me, this needs to be a huge point of discussion in the election that is underway. How we're going to pay this back. How we're going to get this economy going once again. Because it can be done. The solutions are there. They're there. But there's other agendas at play which are not to your benefit, my benefit, or ultimately the country's benefit. And we've got to really peel this back and have hard discussions, but I really can't imagine the two characters that are running for office being able to, you know, do this or have this conversation that lasts any longer than about three sentences. They just don't seem capable of it. So it's going to be up to us in the end to be able to to go there, to be able to have this talk. It's so important. It's so important for us, even for next year. For next year, we've got to have these things kind of resolved. All right, everybody, that's a little look at the petrodollar. I don't think it's going to last a whole lot longer. I really, really don't. And if you've got savings, you know, Apple's great. It's been a great stock. You know, so is Disney. So are all these other things. But their pods are propped up by fake money pouring out of the Fed. Every day, they're in that market, you know, buying this and buying that and keeping the VIX from going up. They're doing the best they can to keep the illusion that they're in control. But it's just an illusion. It's just an illusion. And as soon as some disturbance hits that illusion, it's like the smoke clears and you see the dude behind the curtain. And then you realize, oh my God, we've all been had. All right, guys, um, thanks for stopping in. We'll do this again on Monday. I have no idea what we'll talk about, but we'll make it interesting. Until then, tomorrow afternoon at 5 o'clock, we'll have a look at the weather, see what's going on in China. The flooding just doesn't look like that's going to end. And, you know, all these other things have not even been wrapped up into this conversation. You know, there's so many things that need to be talked about, and they're just not being talked about. We can't get past the social issues of the day, and that's that literally is a crying shame. It's a crying shame. It does nobody a, a, a service if we can't have an intelligent, smart discussion about the issues that truly, truly face us ahead. All right, everybody, thanks uh, for stopping by. Have a great evening, and I'll see you soon. In the meanwhile, hey, keep looking.